My name is Mitch Weisberg. Um, we're going to do an experiment tonight. We're going to uh, delve into some of the questions that were raised in the EdChat Twitter chat last night. Uh, the EdChat last night was based on the question, how do we go from teacher-centered teaching to student-centered learning? Uh, Tom Whippy's here with me. And I think Joyce would be is here and some of the moderators from last night. And let's see what kind of discussion we can get going. Uh, you know, we have guidelines up here on the screen. What I think that I'll do is I'm going to move that temporarily to full screen so that you can see it better. Um, we're looking to get all of you in, involved in the discussions. Um, with, you know, if when we're not looking for monologues. Uh, it probably works best if you, you know, if you have something that you can say in, say, a minute or so. Uh, but we will probe, so we'll ask some some additional questions and hopefully get the creative juices going in all of you. So remember, this is a, this is a discussion from each of us. Uh, we're looking to um, to uh, provoke thought, not provoke anger. And uh, let's let, let me just uh, go through a, a, a few notes. Um, First of all, so what is EdChat Interactive? Uh, EdChat Interactive was started by uh, Tom Whitby, Steve Anderson, and myself uh, for the purpose of mirroring the best practices of uh, professional development online. And so uh, what, what we try to do is we have people, you all, uh, learn by interacting, reflecting, and participating uh, discussing, in other words, instead of, uh, instead of sitting back and watching. So the way we do that is we use the Shindig platform, um, and there's a few options here on the Shindig platform that you should know, uh, and they're there on the bottom of your screen. So you'll see that there's a text chat button, um, and if you click on text chat, that'll give you the ability to um, to, ch to text chat with the other people who are here. I'll, I will say that the one person who cannot see the text chat is me, but Tom will be able to see it and he'll be able to respond. Uh, you can ask a question, that question will go to me, uh, and then I can either address the question um, or pull you up to discuss the question, um, or, uh, or Tom and I can talk about the question. And then there's the raise hand. There's going to be different times where um, you, you'll want to come on stage and we'll, or we will say, please come on stage. You're going to click on the raise hand button. Uh, that, let us know that, that lets us know that you'd like to come up on stage, in which case we'll bring you on stage and we can pursue the discussion. So let me just um, show you a minute about text chat. When you click on that text chat button, which I'd like all of you to do, uh, a dialog box opens where you can talk to um, other people and you can put in your comments um, and discuss them with people. You can, you can move the text box around by grabbing the top and you can close it by clicking on the X in the top right hand corner. And then... Um, the real reason why we think Shindig is a perfect platform for this type of discussion is that it allows for small group discussions. Uh, so you'll be able to click on the avatar of another person. We may have times during the night where we ask you to break into small groups. It's assuming um, that there's enough people to do that. So you'll just click on the avatar of another person and you'll join the, the, the group. And I uh, also want to point out that next week... Um, on, um, I think it's Wednesday, we're having Friday. Uh, the Friday Institute, which is a part, division of uh, North Carolina State, is uh, going to be talking about the second part in their series. They're going to be talking about empowering students and the learner and learner agency. Uh, that's going to be led by Nancy Mangum and Marianne Wolf. You won't want to miss that. The last session was incredibly interactive and, um, and, and really informative. But for tonight's question, let me uh, shrink this again. And let me bring Tom up. And let's let's see what we find out. So Tom, um, you know, we'll 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 let this go and let's let's see how many people uh, can join us. But um, how are you? I'm fine. I, I'm just wondering if I'm in the right room. I'm seeing we've got three people here. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. And uh, and and two of them are actually Brenda, and she's recording. So right now, it's so um, Brenda and it's me. Just, and you right. 
Right. Uh, but you know, Brenda isn't going to be interacting with us. So um, so I think that uh, we can just talk. So it's maybe, you know, just for my, for, you know, my sake, you were on the Twitter chat last night. I was in the middle of doing a couple other things. What were some of the things that were raised last night in terms of uh, going from teacher-centered teaching to student-centered learning? Well, we're, we're finding that um, there are, are many varying degrees of experience with this um, because, quite honestly, I, I think most of uh, what our educators are doing today uh, is based on, on focusing on both lecture and direct instruction, which is – which is teacher-centered. Uh, again, that that was always the 20th century model. It was the 19th century model. It was also the 18th century model, uh, where, where lecture and direct instruction were the focus of education. Um, when we talk about student-centered learning, we're talking about things that are uh, a little bit different in uh, problem-based learning or project-based learning uh, is one way to do it. I, I'll, Great many teachers use um, simulations also. Um, mm -hmm. and all, all of this is, is considered to be student-based student, student -based learning. But I, again, well, many of our educators are, are products and victims of a, of a 20th century education. Uh, they were taught one way and they expect that um, teaching that same way is going to work for their students. When we're finding more and more the student of today is very – interactive through the use of uh, technology. Therefore, they, they, they learn differently than, than uh, we learned back in the 20th century. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, even as adults, we don't always um, get as much from lectures as we do from actually participating in our own learning. It's, it's something that people just do naturally. The, the more you participate in your learning, the more you own it and, and the more it stays with you. So, can, like, what were some of the examples that some of the people brought up as, um, you know, first of all, of direct instruction, and second of all, of, uh, you know, student-centered learning or project-based learning or the different aspects, yeah. the different types of student-centered learning? The, you know, direct instruction is, is uh, the best way to explain it is uh, um, a teacher will give an example of something. And then um, a teacher and students will give an example of things together, and then the students give an example of something. That would be direct instruction. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's quite often the focus, that and lecture, um, within the model that, that most people are using today. Uh, the student-centered uh, gives students more voice in, in, in what's going on. Um, for instance, um, Trying to think of examples of pe people used, um, I you know I wasn't involved in, in that part of the, the chat where people were actually coming up with examples. Okay. Um, but pe people who who work on projects in in the idea that uh, they, they're kind of individualized projects. One of the things that, that I said last night was that if if the due date comes for your project to be turned in and all of your students turn in the project and they all look alike. You didn't give a project; you gave a recipe, and and, and that's uh, quite often what what teachers do with their with their projects, as opposed to uh, uh, devising uh, projects or or using student input for what projects they would like to do to um, show examples of what they have learned or what they hope to learn uh, through these projects. That would be more student centered, if that makes sense. So what I've heard a lot in terms of student projects is that uh, they give students agency, that right. students, uh, what does that term mean? Uh, it's, it's allowing um, students to have voice and, and that voice have, um, have value to it. Uh, for instance, up until recently, most kids don't have any input as to what it is they want to learn, um, what it is their interests are. Uh, in, in engaging, engaging a kid in a lesson using something that they have a built-in interest in is, is one way to uh, guarantee 
student involvement because mm -hmm. if they are interested in a subject and you're using that subject for their learning, um, they, they tend to pay attention to what's going on. So um, one of the problems- And not just kids, always, right? Even adults yeah, too, for that matter. Too. Yeah, adults too. But one of the problems that, that we had in the past was it's difficult to keep track of all, all of these things and it's difficult to address 25 or, or 28, depending on how many people you have in your class, uh, individual needs. But through the use of technology, uh, those problems are easily overcome because we can keep track of 28 people with, with, without a problem. Uh, and, and the work that they do can be uh, placed on a file as opposed to, you know, large projects of, you know, many pages. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of two different directions. One is, um, you know, the statement, you can use technology to, to help you keep track of 28 different projects or 28 and 28 different kids doing 28 different things. And then the other thing was you mentioned earlier that you, that you were um, involved with a different part of the Ed Chat uh, Twitter chat last night. And so, right. um, so where I think I'm going to go first is what, what were you involved in, in the Twitter chat? What, like, what rang your chimes? Um, well, when I actually have to work the chat, so uh, right. I, I don't, get, I don't get to, um, uh, involve myself with, with personal stuff that I've done. But, um, you know, anytime you go into a chat, you've got to realize that when you go into a chat, it's it's like walking into a football stadium. You can't have a conversation with everybody in that football stadium. So you, you try and pick and choose people or, or come up with some provocative uh, statements that people will latch on to. So you engage four or five different people uh, in, in a conversation where there might be 100 people in the chat. You're really concentrating mm -hmm. on those four or five people. And, and the, the tweets that you send back and forth with those four or five people, everybody gets to observe so other people can jump in or jump out of the chat, you know, the, that, that portion of the conversation. Right. So, and, so then what was maybe one or two of those, of those topics? Are you killing me here, Mitch? I'd have to go back to the archive. To look. <laughs> no, oh. no, that you were, was, was there anything that you, that struck you that teachers were saying, or people were saying, well, this is what we should do, or here's the problem, or here's the solution. There was, there was, uh, again, the audience that we have is, is fairly tech savvy. Uh, right. Otherwise they wouldn't be there. So, so their perspective, I think is, is a little more, um, um, more of the perspective that we want in dealing with 21st century ideas, because these are the people who are actually implementing those 21st century right. ideas. It would be nice if we could have these same discussions with, with teachers who are locked in the 20th century, uh, but they're not coming to the table because of the technology in, in many right. cases. So um, there was much support for the idea of student-centered learning in this. And, and again, uh, you know, I don't believe the entire year can be focused on student-centered learning, but the entire year should not be focused on lecture and direct instruction as it is now. There's, there's got to be a balance. We'll always have lecture and, and direct instruction. It will always be with us, but we have to be more thoughtful with it, and, and we have to realize that it can't be the focus of the year's work. Uh, we really have to get students to be more involved in their learning. It, it, again, it's it's kind of like um, teaching them how to learn as opposed to teaching them what to learn. They can figure out what it is they need to learn. Uh, but but how to go about doing that uh, is the important skill that, that we have to develop in students. You know, the whole idea of, of how to how to go about researching something, uh, how how to critically think and critically analyze. You know, critical thinking has to become a, a large part of, of what we're going to do or, or our entire life is going to be run by sound bites. Um, so, so we want kids to, be, to, to critically think and be able to do research and then create ideas from that and then communicate those ideas out. And all of these require the tools for technology that we're using today. Um, and, and, and people who are not using those tools for technology 
I don't think are, are properly preparing our students for what they're going to need to understand in their world moving forward. Because if a kid is going to to um, survive and, and, and compete in their world, it will be in dealing with tools of technology. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not going into to the library and going through the card catalog anymore. So it's, it seems to me that if I'm involved in a class and the students come to the class and they're, uh, they've got all these different interests that I'm not sure I see how technology allows me to customize the class for each one. So let's just say I'm teaching an eighth grade, um, I know, social studies class, and I've got kids in the class who um, who are doing work at the 10th grade level. I've got kids at the eighth grade level. I've got kids who don't speak English very well. Um, I've got kids who are um, taking care of their own siblings. Um, I've got kids whose parents are very involved. I've got kids whose parents aren't very involved. How do I teach social studies or histories to 28 different kids Okay. Reaching every one of them. Um, well, let's say we, we want to develop um, – this is like off the top of my head. So um, let's say we want to talk well, about – At least you have more hair than I do. Say again? Oh, yeah. Okay. At least you have more hair than I do. So <laughs> Let's say uh, we want to talk about innovation in the 20th century. Um, talking about innovation in the 20th century in, in history, um, we can – it doesn't matter to us who a student chooses as an innovator from the 20th century. Would that, would that be a, a correct right. statement? Right. Okay. okay. So, so therefore we could wind up with, well, uh, as long as the person was an innovator, I mean, you yeah, know, like, was there an right. now we could, we could come up with, with a possible list, but, but you don't want to limit kids to a list. So we can come up with a suggested list. And if they have other people that they want to add to the list and, and make their choice, that would be fine. But you, you don't want a lot of duplication of things. So, mm -hmm. you, don't want, you know, everybody doing Jimi Hendrix, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. So, so th there have, have, has to be some limitations. The, the other thing that, that would be important in this, you know, if I were teaching it, and, you know, I, I did, not in social studies, but in English, uh, we developed uh, rubrics. And the rubrics mm -hmm. for these projects um, as to what was expected, what they, they should look like, what would determine um, an A, what would determine a B, what would determine a C. Um, all of these rubrics were established by the class. You know, I, as the teacher, would, would ask them, what do you think an A paper would look like in regard to um, how it should be grammatically um, worked mm -hmm. out? You know, how many grammar mm -hmm. mistakes would, would – would, would you have to make in order to get a B or, or how many grammar mistakes would you have to? Or today the student wouldn't even have to do a paper, right? They could do a video. They could create a video game. They could. Yeah, that's exactly um, right. And, and, and that's where the, where the student voice comes in. They, they can use their strengths as to whatever their strengths are. Certainly, mm -hmm. you know, part, part of this, a, a good part of it has to be um, the research and, and how they communicate that research to their audience. Uh, would mm -hmm. be part of whatever the rubric is. Were you successful in um, communicating your ideas across to the audience? Would be you know mm -hmm. one aspect of the rubric. So so yeah, they they could use um, various things. Some students may want to do video. Some may want to do music. Uh, some mm -hmm. may want to do poetry. Some but but I, 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 again, um, if we're talking about social studies, we're really looking more. Um, less of artistic stuff and more um, facts. Mm -hmm. So I would mm -hmm. imagine it would be probably more based in, in text, but you could mm -hmm. certainly work with videos depending on who, who you have uh, videos or music. So, you know, at that point you're, you're going to wind up with, um, you could have 28 completely different looking projects that kids bring in. And, and again, they're using communication tools uh, from the computer to put that stuff out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, giving them, giving them a voice in their choices, voice and choice, uh, giving them a voice in their choices as to how to represent what it is they've learned. 
Interesting. So, uh, so we have a few people who have joined us, and uh, I'll uh, let you know that uh, if you have video um, and or um, audio, uh, you can come up and discuss these questions or your own thoughts related to these questions yourself. And what you'll do is is you'll see that there's. And let me let me just go back to the slide here for a minute uh, that has that. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, you notice that on the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand button. Um, and so if you you um, raise your hand, then uh, I'll know that you're willing to come up on stage and talk about these questions with us. And the, the focus of the discussion is based on the topic last night from the EdChat Twitter chat. Uh, the, the topic was how do we go from teacher-centered teaching to student-centered teaching? And right now I've been asking Tom, who is uh, uh, the, one of the founders and the leaders of EdChat, the EdChat hashtag, about what he learned from um, from the session last night. And then I, I was challenging him about whether technology can, in fact, help teachers uh, conduct a, a, a student-centered classroom. So, um, you know, we were, we were talking about, um, I guess, some of the some of the salient points of last night. I wonder wonder if uh, you can remember any of the other, like any quips that people said that you thought were especially interesting to you. Uh, who, me? Yeah, of course <laughs> you. For, of course, you and then anybody else who's in the audience who, who participated. I'd like to hear from some other people as to what went on. Uh, you know, again, I was involved with, with probably five, five different people. Uh, we, okay. we should mention the moderators that we had on, by the way. Um, the moderators um, for for this chat are the, the ones who generally moderate each and every week. We have uh, Nancy Blair, um, mm -hmm. we have uh, Sean Thomas, uh, Mark Weston, William Chamberlain, and Sean Thomas. All of them are educators, um, uh -huh. and and they during the course of the chat they're involved with with their people. Whoever you know picks up, and um, they're mm -hmm. also available if anybody needs any technical help. So uh, that's what that's kind of what moves the chat along. They come up with their own rather provocative questions during the course of the evening, and um, that's it. So I, I was expecting some of them to stop by tonight on this. Uh, they have still might. Yep. Yeah, they still we have a while. And then I, you know what I should have also mentioned to people who have just joined us is that the another thing underneath your your avatar is something called text chat. And let me just expand this again. So maybe that'll make it a bit easier to see. And that if you click on that text chat button, you can text um, either the other people in the session tonight um, and Tom. The one person you can't text is me um, because I, I I can't see the text chat. So so let's so um, I, but I'm really interested to hear from some of you in the audience. Uh, maybe. Um, maybe Joyce or um, or, or Steve, uh, for, were you on the text chat last night and or what are some examples that you have about student-centered learning? Um, or do you think that, that this the, the, for, the, um, the question itself is wrong? Uh, do you think that we're better off that, that you know the teacher is the person who's in front of the class, the teacher controls the class? Maybe we're better off having the teacher um, teacher centered learning because the teacher is the focal point. What, did anybody argue that last night? Anybody agree with that? Not that I saw. Not one person, huh? Um, so, um, yeah, uh, Joyce talked about bringing up a particular site, but um, uh, I don't know that I can I can uh, share my screen like that. Um, but she pointed to the Innovative Educator um, site. And, uh, Joyce, if you can put that into the chat window, then at least other people that's can see not, it. That's Lisa Nielsen's site, I think. Lisa Nielsen's ah, okay. blog site. But I'm gonna let me let me bring Joyce up, okay. and I uh, you know, and I'll introduce you to. Okay. So in a second, Joyce will be here. Hey, Joyce. Hi there. Can you hear? How us? are you? Hey. Good. <laughs> I good. can hear you. Can you hear me? I know I was on mute yep, for perfect. a bit. 
All right, I did put the link to the site um, up in the chat as well. And it is a Lisa Nielsen site, Tom. You're absolutely right about that. Um, interestingly enough, um, Lisa Nielsen, is it the Innovative Educator? Is that her blog? Is that what it's called? Tom? Yes. Um, so she had a post that, or a tweet that was out, and I, it was, I guess it was in reference to one of the things we talked about last night, and it had a, a kind of a pyramid of Maslow's, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm losing my words here, um, uh, Maslow's um, hierarchy, hierarchy of needs, right? So the whole mm -hmm. hierarchy of needs and so forth. And um, and I retweeted it and I said, yeah, that's a really, you know, great thing. It's just in time for the EdChat um, interactive that we're having tonight, which is talking about teacher center versus learner center. And she sent me the link to this page or this blog post that she had. And if you pull that on up, the continuum of voice was really quite interesting and I it's Kathleen McClaskey is one of my friends Tom from my old um, uh, Vizel days and but it really kind of pulls into um, light that it's a continuum and it's not necessarily that you're doing one thing all the time right it, it can't always just be learner driven sometimes you need direction. There has to be some direct instruction. And sometimes it's sort of in the middle. So it's a continuum. And for what part of what lesson for which child or group of children that you need to differentiate, do you use which type of technique? You need to be fluid about that as you're moving groups around and you have um, like dynamic differentiation of groups and today we're learning fractions and yesterday we were, you know tomorrow we're learning decimals well you might have gotten the fractions because it was very concrete when I got to decimals you just lost it so I need to move you into a different group to get you partnered up with different children that you can collaborate with and it's a little bit of that art of teaching it's not a science yeah. it's an art that's, that's exactly right no. Not but this is a really is great it, but if if you're um if you're letting the kids work with each other, then isn't that diminishing your role as the teacher? Aren't you supposed to be running things? No, no, you're firing up the kids who can peer teach, right? Because for that let's say child who is taking the lead to help his buddy understand that, you know, um, 0.5 is the same thing as five tenths and why they're the same thing. The child who's explaining it to his buddy, it just gets more concrete in his head. And you've got to teaching remember, is the, you've go ahead. Got to remember you're still the man behind the curtain or the woman yeah. behind the curtain. Right. Well, there you go. Um, Absolutely. You watch yourself. How you, how you control the class and how you lead the class is different than standing up and driving information into their heads. Um, yes. Driving information into their heads does not work. We know it does not work. Um, yeah. the, the, least, the, the least effective ways to teach in the area of lecture and direction, direct instruction. Mm -hmm. We know that. Collaboration is one of the highest um, – it's got the, the highest success rate for – for people learning, mm -hmm. so you know, yeah. why would you why would you fly in the face of that? Uh, you hey. want to you want to create um, an atmosphere where collaboration is not considered to be cheating, but it's actually uh, learning collaboratively. And and doing so many different things beyond just delivery of a skill or a nugget of knowledge. I was at a school recently um, in. Medford, Long Island, and we were showing um, these children uh, augmented reality technology and having this whole workshop, and it was a lot of fun. And we put on uh, one child the Microsoft Hollow Lens um, so that he was doing the augmented reality and, and so forth, and we showed him how to use it and then said to him, okay, now you show the next kid. <gasps> Magic. Magic happened because that one kid then began directing other kids and then the next kid direct and it was like the domino effect and we got to the third or fourth uh, girl down the road and and the first boy had to come back and say no 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 you you had to click like this and he was it was beautiful the the teacher was able to walk away and do something else with other kids and we were had different groups that were working on different projects we had 
23 sixth graders engaged in this whole very um, hands-on kind of an activity of redesigning a portion of their library for three hours. There wasn't one kid who had his hand up asking to go to the bathroom in three hours. There wasn't one kid who sat down in the back and started, I don't know, looking at his iPhone or something, right? And they, they were like all doing stuff and, and debating with each okay. other about what they wanted so, to get done. Was cool. So that's so that's nice. I'm going to be really devil's advocate here. That's nice. So yeah. that they were they were engaged, but did they did they learn anything? I mean, was there stuff that they learned that they that uh, we can measure that they you know, are they going to score higher on the test? What, 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 is, what was a company? Oh, 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 you're killing me. <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking. That, I know, but it's the hardest well, thing because well, you know, what does the test, you know, what does the test really do? I mean, you know, now I'm you, sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Well, if you sat down and talked to them about what it is they learned, I'm sure they could explain that to you. Yeah. But you, you know, are, are you going to give them a uh, testing? Is so difficult to, to, to really accept as, as something that we, we need. I, I think there are assessments that we can do of kids that are, are far more um, practical, real world, relevant. You know, if you if you go for a job, you know, as an adult, generally they don't ask to see your. Um, your, your your records your your academic records they don't ask to see that what they ask good thing you. good thing yeah yeah for most <laughs> of it. um but what they ask you to do is is show what it is you've accomplished in in the form of what projects have you worked on uh what deals have you done what you know they they want to see uh, your portfolio of work and and that's how we should be assessing kids with, 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 you know, if we set kids up with electronic portfolios, for instance, when they're in grammar school, so that all of their work is, is recorded and, and, and kept on a file and it follows them through, we're not talking about test scores, we're talking about the actual projects that they did um, and the work that they've accomplished, and that follows them through their entire career. We'll have a much better picture of, of what that kid is capable of doing than if we look at grades that are very subjective. And, and, right. and, but more okay, often than okay, I, but if I'm, to, if I'm a teacher, yeah. okay, and I teach my kids like this class that Joyce talked about and they were really engaged and, um, and they were doing stuff together and maybe they were learning, but, um, but then. Um, but there was a culminating I, activity, Mitch. Okay. So you have to take that into consideration. The children okay. presented to each other. So um, these pairs there was two pairs of, of students there was a couple of groups of three they they got up in front of the entire class and presented their final project to each other mm -hmm. after that three hours and then they voted on the one they liked best and they threw that on the and they threw that on the, the 3d printer so um there was a culminating activity and you could score that if you needed to and say you know that activity demonstrated um collaboration creativity um some sort of, you know, uh, use of all of the elements that needed to be used. I mean, whatever it is, your criteria is that you were measuring and so forth. So you, you could judge that, but Tom's right. It's, this is, these are the types of real intense learning experiences. I think that fire kids up and make them have fun with learning and make them want to um, get all of the data in place that they need to know in order to accomplish this goal. Because if they didn't know how big something was, they had to figure out how to measure it and they had to figure out how to do things. Um, and because they were driven to figure that stuff out, they learned it better. But it's probably one of the hardest things to see on a, on a you know, standardized test. So, um, Yeah, and I get, I, get, I get how saying this kid is a 92 and this kid is a 70 and this kid is an 85. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's grossly unfair to the kids. It doesn't really mean anything except for the fact that it's just a number and obviously 92 is higher than an 85. Um, but it doesn't reflect, um, it doesn't really reflect who the kid was. But mm -hmm. as a teacher, if I know that if I, if I teach in the seat on the old teacher centered way and my kids don't do well, at least I could point to the fact that, Hey, I'm teaching the way you told me to, but if I try teaching in this new way and my kids don't score on the test, don't score well on the tests, then you're going to come back and say, well, you're a bad teacher. You didn't even teach according to the way we wanted you to. Well, it also depends if they're testing for what you're teaching. 
Well, I have to teach to what they're testing, right? Say again? I have to teach to what they're testing, don't I? That's how I'm being measured. Yeah, that's, you know, that is the, um, you know, that, and that's, uh, that's a conundrum right there. I've never believed in teaching to the test. I've always believed in, in teaching to the students and, and consequently they did well in the tests. I never had a problem with that, but I never taught for the test. Um, my kids were exposed to, you know, I would give them when we had to do a standardized test just to familiarize them with the test two weeks before they would take a practice test in the same form that they were going to take the standardized test in. And, and that was as much preparation for, for a test as I did. There are school districts, and, and this is criminal. There are school districts which demand that teachers spend three months in test preparation. They can't teach anything other than test preparation. Now, now how, how, how can you justify that in an academic school year, taking two months out just for test preparation? What are you teaching the kids? Well, how do we change that? How do we, how do we, so how do we change that? There are so many gonna, districts, especially in New York, that have gone for um, waivers, right? And they, mm -hmm. they've just bucked the system and they said, no, we also have in New York a whole cadre of parents who uh, just uh, opted out and they've said, no, I'm not right. going to have my child, right? right? So it, it's got to be, you know, um, and, and it's going to be different in different places, but um, it well, we, we're also, we're we can learn from stuff. places like Finland where they do things in kind of a different way. And there's a lot of stuff that's out there that we can all begin to say, um, you know, it's really about the, the product. The, the saying is that you don't want to go out and buy a new drill, or maybe you do, but you don't really mm -hmm. need the, want the drill, you want the hole. Right. Right. And right. we've spent all this time on on the drill on, oh, it's got to have, you know, X amount of horsepower and blah, blah, blah. No, we want the whole, which is the shining kid who comes to school saying, guess what I just figured out? You know, 0.5 is the same thing as five tenths is the same thing as 22 forty fourths. I mean, right. Wow. The light just went on and you, you figured out that there's congruence and all these yeah. big concepts that lead you to, you know. If a Maybe teacher's solving doing what, the Big Bang Theory, if a teacher's doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that's you know creating lesson plans as they go, each of those lesson plans has a series of goals that the teacher wants to wants to ob obtain for those students. Now, during the course of this, we use what's called formative assessment. Um, the, the, there are two, actually three types of, of assessments, but uh, the, one assessment is formative assessment; the other is summative assessment. And, and the, the way to tell a difference when I, when I was teaching that in, in college, I would tell my students, think of yourself as, as a chef. As a chef is creating the dish, they're tasting it as it goes along and they make adjustments. That's formative assessment. The summative assessment comes when the diner sits down and eats the meal and then responds to how it tasted. Now, it, it, if you think of, of, of your lesson the same way, the formative assessment is, is during the course – uh, of these, the, the learning with the kids, you, you're assessing by, by and and uh, giving them suggestions, giving them feedback, and keeping them in line with what it is they have to do. And then at the end, there has to be some sort of summative assessment to mm -hmm. to uh, obtain whether or not the kid absorbed what it is your goals were. And that could be as as simple as as a portfolio, you know, looking at the kid's work. Um. Or, or, or sitting down with a kid and saying, hey, what would you learn from this? And if they can mm -hmm. articulate things that they have learned and give you specific examples of what it is they're doing that they didn't know before, then that's an indication that, that you're doing your work. It does not necessarily have to be a grade. Joyce mentioned Finland. Finland doesn't give a test to their kids until the last, the last thing they do in, the, in their academic career. They don't get tests. And Finland, you know, for years was the number one place that everybody – wanted to be like well if we want to be like them then let's do the same thing right. don't give a test until the kid's senior year so i think and that the, was a good and the, and the other thing too here's what drives me crazy the other thing too everything in real life when, when, when you've got to take a test if you screw up on a test you take it again it doesn't matter who you are you know sure. you can take the bar yeah. exam as many times as you want you can take a, a driver's license uh, test as many times as you want you can take the uh the, the um the test for, for driver's insurance. 
uh, that, 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 that traffic <laughs> test that you got in New York. You take that as many times as you want until you get the grade that you want. We don't do that with kids. It's, it's like sink right. or swim on, on one shot, and it's, it's not fair. It doesn't make sense. It's like That's you have that friend who has the whole series of books about teachers throwing up grades, right? Or throwing out grades, not throwing up grades. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> um, yeah. so, so I think that was the you kind of we touched on a number of the things that were brought up in the Ed chat last night, and this was a good example of how these types of discussions work. Um, and I know this is being recorded, so we can use this as a way of uh, letting people know for the next time what a discussion like this is is like. Uh, Tom, do you have you want to just close with um, with with some thoughts about this type of discussion? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't have more people here tonight, to be honest with you. Um, I was kind of, you know, judging from, from what we had in, in the uh, Ed Chat last night, we had quite a few people participating, so I, I thought the carryover would be um, higher than what it was. We have uh, this momentum. Is more, this is more right. like a panel yeah. discussion, what we're doing right. here. Um, but I, I like the idea that uh, you can see the interaction. You can see the people that, that are talking. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you can't convey passion in, in a tweet, but you can when people actually see your face. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would like to uh, continue this if we could, but um, yeah. we, we mm -hmm. would be good if we can get more people involved with it. Okay. Yeah, Joyce, we, we do, you, do you have thoughts? I, I think you're right. It would be nice to have more folks. I think it would have been nice. We, uh, Sean, who was there, I was going to say at one point, but we were just on a roll that we should, you know, drop the slides and bring Sean on up and she could have um, also contributed she couldn't, she couldn't on. Come yeah. Up. Yeah, I, oh, I we checked couldn't. with her. She couldn't, she couldn't come up. Yeah. Okay. But, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's, it's fun not to have a slide deck with predefined content to have to absorb and just to have the discussion, right? Um, yeah. I kind of, you know, stretched the rule because Lisa sent me this thing today and I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I was talking with some um, some folks about the same thing. So I used it during my discussion with them. But um, yeah, I, I think it's fun. And if we can get more folks, we just need to get the word on out and uh, and we can have more dialogues like this. Okay. Well, I'm Sorry. hoping that um, that next time, that those of you who watch the, uh, the archives of this, that uh, you decide that you want to join us. Um, I think we had a good discussion. And uh, Joyce, good luck in your, your in your presentations tomorrow. Uh, Tom, good luck in um, surviving another day without Joyce. And uh, and Mitch, um, good luck. Hope you find a nice glass of wine. So, Ooh. right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, th Thanks, thank you. Mitch. Uh, okay. okay guys. Uh, bye. Okay. Bye, Tom. Uh, bye, Joyce. And this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive, and hope to see you all next week.